Yeah, that's that's good. Anyway, good evening to you all. Um, looks as though we've got a good number of people um, viewing tonight, including um, an overseas uh, audience as well. I, I've seen um, um, PAs, VKs, and S5, which I think is Slovenia, and um, DG uh, logged in. So um, um, uh, welcome to uh, everyone wherever you are, and uh, uh, and I guess for the VK uh, viewers, it's uh, it's good morning to you. Um, we are using Zoom this time to uh, link to the uh, BATC, BATC uh, server, um, uh, streamer rather. Um, so hopefully we won't have the uh, sound quality um, problems that we had uh, on the, uh, the first talk. So um, as a way of introduction, introduction to uh, Brian, G8DKK, who is going to talk to us about um, uh, vector network uh, analyzers. Um, Brian uh, uh, is a retired professional RF and microwave measurements engineer who um, has spent um, uh, 45 years in the business before retiring. Uh, he's been involved with VNAs uh, uh, professionally as applications engineer and later um, project manager for scalar and network uh, vector network analyzers and spectrum analyzers. His last employed uh, work in, uh, was for a UK company designing and manufacturing, albeit in Shanghai, satellite LNBs and VSAT SAT ODU, outdoor units. Uh, and uh, that involved him in extensive use of 40 gigahertz and 50 gigahertz Agilent, now key site, of course, VNAs. His amateur radio interest, um, well, Brian was licensed um, 50 years ago as G8DKK. So congratulations on having that call for uh, 50 years, Brian. Um, and um, his main interest, a bit like mine really, is uh, VHF and up operation and uh, construction. He is currently um, active on um, four meters to 13 centimeters plus, uh, plus uh, three centimeters. And he tells me he is um, building a, a new transverter for the 24 giga giga gigahertz um, band uh, for portable operation uh, in 2020. And he says it's te temporarily been shelved to uh, create this presentation because I know Brian's been working on this for about um, three weeks. Um, Brian does have uh, HF capability, but um, mostly for uh, SWL. Right, I'd now like to um, uh, hand over to uh, Brian, if you'd like to unmute your video and your audio, Brian, and um, uh, then um, we can um, uh, let you go ahead with your uh, presentation, which I think we're all looking forward to. So over to you, Brian. So very good evening to everybody, and uh, I seem to be, uh, as Neil said, has told me there's quite a few people logged in. So, okay, I called this, um, uh, this presentation, the comparison of nano VNAs, and if we go on um, <laughs> eBay there are, and, and type in nano VNA into the search uh, box, you get an absolute uh, raft of, uh, of these things that pop up, and there are quite a few different variants. Um, it's obviously not possible to um, go through them all, but um, I've got two here. I don't know why I need two, because I've already got two other VNAs. But, um, it serves as part of the useful uh, comparison. So this talk is not really, a, a, if, if you're expecting a beginner's guide and how to um, uh, presentation, it's not like that at all. Um, you can get those on uh, YouTube. This is more of an analysis of um, what they do and, um, uh, and what the architecture is like and uh, some of the, um, uh, the nice things, some of the flaws. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's the intention. So, uh, get this thing to go. That's it. Right. So, just a list of uh, topics. Going to start off with one slide, which is a, a, a and one or two sides about BNA history, where it all started, because actually BNAs are relatively modern. A um, couple of slides on scalar versus vector, and we'll get to that. B 
bit of a <clears throat> what are we comparing against? How do we do this comparison? Um, and then look at some what I call low price VNAs. That's fairly obvious because most of them are like that on um, uh, on eBay. Um, VNA architecture. What what, what um, architecture? And some of it's um, published on on, um, on the websites of the people that sell these things. Um, and then I want to talk particularly about calibration and calibration kits because there are, those are two very important points with uh, any VNA. And then there's a few measurements and observations on, on those measurements that uh, come through to describe various things that uh, will appear on the screen. And lastly, um, uh, some slides on uh, on uh, the nano vna pc software there are a few software packages that um, are available for these things so i'll just be talking about those and uh, and then we'll just sum up with some uh, pros and cons on these things so vna history um well the first recognizable vector network analyzers were produced by what was then Hewlett Packard in the uh, late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, <clears throat> probably the most well known initially was a thing called the HP 8410. I have a very good friend who was a salesman with HP at that time, and he always describes it as, as several boxes, um, one of which was just full of directional couplers and spectrum analyzer bits, which is how they they started, that's what they were made from, receivers from spectrum analyzers. Um, and then they got a bit more sophisticated and, um, uh, with the HP 8510, but it was still quite a monster that sat in a rack, um, but went up to quite high frequency. Um, there's, there's also quite well known, I know a number of people, um, amateurs in the microwave group who have um, there's one or two that have the 8753, which is a, a 3 gig and there's a 6 gig version. And um, HP, of course, uh, split off their um, instruments division and called it Ag Agilent. And um, because they became a computer company in the 1980s, um, which I'm sure uh, <coughs> Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard uh, <laughs> wouldn't have been pleased about. Um, and they're now renamed again and uh, call themselves Keysight. Um, uh, the uh, latest ones that I use for the PNA series up to uh, 1450 gigs. There are other manufacturers around. Um, most well known again are probably originally Wiltron, became Amrit, so Wiltron and just dropped the Wiltron name. Both uh, uh, American, of course, Amrit is Japanese, and Rodenschwartz in uh, Germany, of course. Um, <clears throat> the first handheld VNA that uh, appeared on the market was a thing called the Wiltron Sightmaster. And um, it was 1990s technology, uh, late 90s actually. Um, and it was just a single port VNA for antenna installers, uh, people putting up uh, mobile phone masks, <laughs> uh, an obvious market. Um, and my comment, of course, is that these are all professional VNAs at professional prices. So, what about amateur price two port vector network analyzers? So, remember, there's a difference. A two port VNA is what it says, it has a port for measuring reflection, reflected signals, and a port for measuring. Uh, um, uh, receiver signals, if you like, insertion loss, and so on, um, as opposed to um, single port devices, which are usually referred to as antenna analyzers. So, the earliest one I can find um, is the N2PK, November 2 Papa Kilo, um, which was a kit build system, and it was published in the ARRL QEX magazine in July, August 2004, and it was designed for home construction. And I guess that quite a few of these were built. I, um, some a year or 
two probably later um, after the uh, magazine was published so I was given a copy uh, by a very good friend of that particular one uh, magazine and um, and so I was able to read up about the M2PK but um, I was still working with these things professionally at the time and I didn't take that any further. Um, somewhat later Professor Tom Byer, DG8 SAQ, designed a thing called the VNWA that was made available in around about 2009 um, and that's actually the version 3 because he did actually have a version 2 earlier than that but uh, um, the version 3 was released in 2009 and is still available although it's now called um, more often referred to as the 3E and more recently the 3SE which is um, has uh, imp well, made some further additions to it. In fact I've recently upgraded mine to a 3SE which I'm quite pleased with. And they're available from uh, in the UK from SDR kits and I know there are some uh, suppliers outside the UK. Um, there are other two port BNAs around. Mini Radio Solutions have, a, have two. They have a thing called the Mini VNA Tiny and the Mini VNA Pro. And uh, in the States, in the USA, Array Solutions uh, have a, a number of models. Um, all of these VNAs are, uh, I thought, were reasonable cost because I'm used to. Um, professional prices of course and um, but even so they're <laughs> quite quite a lot more expensive of course than, uh, uh, than the uh, uh, than the uh, nano VNAs uh, that we see on eBay um, <clears throat> all of these uh, uh, earlier two port VNAs all require an external PC to process and display the data um, and I think there's a number of reasons for that but I'm not going to go into that on this side. The other, um, the other amateur things that you are likely to come across are things called antenna analyzers which again there's a plethora of those um, but these are single port and sold purely as antenna analyzers so, um, uh, so that's why some of them uh, do use VNA techniques, um, and some don't. <laughs> and so, um, sorting those out is fairly uh, fairly tricky. And and some of them are quite expensive. The uh, Ukrainian ones by really get big expert are quite expensive uh, in comparison to uh, some of these others. Okay, so th I've had one of these for a number of years. So um, uh, during this uh, exercise, you'll see this um, analyzer appear occasionally to, uh, uh, because what I wanted to do is to verify some of the results that I was getting from the nano BNAs and compare them with this thing, the uh, DG8 SAQ BNWA 3E, which I've, so I've had for um, since 2011, so quite a while. And, um, uh, and that enables me to see the differences and, uh, uh, and understand um, where the uh, nano VNAs are doing different things or not, as the case may be. Some might be the same things. Um, so what if uh, other types? Well, well these, uh, these sort of things have become quite popular in recent years using a spectrum analyzer with a tracking generator um, to do what we call scalar analysis. Now scalar analyzers are devices that only measure in the amplitude domain. They can only measure level. They can't do anything about, um, about phase or real and imaginary parts. Um, and as supplied or as the picture here on the screen of the Rigol and there are other manufacturers of course, I've got a sequent one very similar. Um, they uh, can only measure insertion, loss and gain, but as shown will, will not measure BSWR return loss unless 
you connect something like this in front of them and return lost bridge or BSWR bridge. This particular one shown is made by a manufacturer in um, Wichita, Kansas, and is a uh, three gigahertz RF Wheatstone bridge. And even that's quite expensive. In <laughs> it costs as much as the DG8 SAQ. So um, uh, there we go. But I happen to have one, so um, I can use that for my uh, spectrum analyzer. But um, it's good for a quick look see that there are some limitations of these things. So let's get to the main subject, which is the nano VNA. And I'm going to look at package, sort of packages, uh, features, um, architecture, and set one out from there, and calibration and operation. So that's some of the things I'm going to look at this evening. So here's a couple of pictures. These are the two that I have. The top one in the picture here is the Nano VNA F, as you can see, clearly written on it. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, later one that I bought. And below it is, the, is one of the versions, and that's the problem, of the Nano VNA H, um, and which was the original one. I've had, had mine since about November, December last year. So, um, uh, <clears throat> and when I bought this particular one, there were still quite a few, uh, even then, appearing on eBay. It had been for some months before I decided to buy this thing. Um, this particular one is in a uh, house in a plastic case. And there's a little sort of bump here and the uh, joggle wheel up here, the on-off switch about there, which you won't be able to see. Um, uh, there are other models that are what I sort of describe as open frame. You can almost look in the sides um, and uh, where they're sort of potted. So there are different packages, and different colours. Some of them are white, some are black. So um, there may be some differences, but I suspect there are fewer differences than we might imagine. So um, so that's, uh, that's these, the two that I'm able to look at. This one is a later version, um, which I've had since uh, earlier this year. And it's housed in, now in a metal case. It's a completely metal case. Um, the screen is much bigger. This is a 2.8 inch um, LCD touch screen. And this one is a 4.3 inch screen. And uh, we'll see there have been some other improvements that have been put into, uh, into the units. So that's what I'm going to be talking about mainly. So here is the original Nano VNA H package that I bought, a 2.8 inch pack package. I photographed it with um, a box of a standard size box of matches. So those that are familiar with that particular brand. Um, it's, you know, it's a small box of matches. Um, and uh, you can see the screen is not a lot bigger than the box of matches. So um, uh, that gives you some idea of what you're uh, looking at. Um, <clears throat> this particular unit um, came in this uh, cardboard box with the uh, plastic insert. And so you can see the, the uh, nano VNA. Uh, down this left hand side are a row of three calibration parts that are supplied with this kit. Uh, the top one is the uh, 50 ohm load. And uh, these two, and I can't remember which way around they are, are the short and the open. We'll be talking about those in the calibration kits. Um, down the bottom here, you can see there's some SMA cables. There's two of those. Um, there's a USB cable supplied with it, which is used for charging the internal battery and for um, PC applications. Uh, this part here is an SMA female back-to-back. -back. Um, not a particularly high-quality one. That, uh, um, I could be disparaging and say it's not, it's a pretty poor quality one, but uh, it's another thing. 
uh, and this thing in here with a sort of lanyard which is actually sort of partially hidden looks like a, a small guitar plectrum um, is actually used for tapping the, uh, the screen um, to bring up the, uh, the menus because if you didn't know that it's a touch screen and you didn't touch the screen you wouldn't know how to drive it so um, that's, uh, that's, that's what they've included in there to do that in this package now the problem with this this these particular ones is that as I say they come in a wide variety of styles and uh, they um, so they don't all look the same, they come in a wide variety of packaging and that's because all of these are manufactured in China I think they're all made in Shenzhen which is uh, just to the east of Hong Kong and um, if you've ever looked or been to Shenzhen it is just row upon row of small factory units rows and rows, if you look on Google Earth it's absolutely staggering there must be thousands of these factory units and they're churning out all sorts of stuff and um, it is just amazing and whether whether they're all I doubt they're all made by the same manufacturer but I think they're all working to the same sort of patterns um, and then equally there's a huge number of different um, sellers on eBay I think they all have a limited number each to sell. I suspect there's some rules that um, the, uh, the prime manufacturers put on them. So it's very difficult when you're buying these on eBay to know um, who to buy them from. You just take pot luck. Uh, when I ordered this one, it, um, it, the first uh, um, distributor I used, re reseller I used, it couldn't deliver it. I had to reorder. I did get my money back. That was a good thing. So, um, so there we are. That's the uh, VNA H in the 2.8 inch package. Um, one of the things that this particular um, VNA came with is a, a a menu structure map, and you really do need this in front of you when you first open it up. Um, to be able to drive it so it gives all the menus and I was quite horrified to find that one of the um, members of uh, my local radio club had bought one and his came in a brown cardboard box um, with a plastic bag with the three calibration parts uh, a USB lead and, um, and not much else and he didn't get the structure map at all I offered to copy in mine, but he had discovered, uh, and you can discover that you can download it online, but uh, uh, you won't necessarily get it. But um, uh, this one was quite nice and came with it. So it's obviously, uh, I think I paid probably towards the top end of the uh, Nano VNAH price rather than the low end, which in the UK sells for somewhere around 20 £25 pounds up to. Um, 35 maybe 40 pounds so um, uh, that's uh, that would be the problem with that so let's look at the features they have borrowed these direct, pretty much directly from eBay sites of various sellers as best you can so different features the one key thing they all have is this built-in touch screen LCD display and that's fairly unique because all the previous um, VNAs that have been around pretty much have all required the PC to drive them. These things are standalone. There are different screen sizes, 2.8, which we've seen, um, 4.3 inch, and uh, 4 inch I've seen appear as well. Um, one of the reasons I bought the 4.3 inch version, having bought originally the 2.8, um, was that I found the screen on the 2.8 inch uh, unit just too difficult to read. The trace data was okay, but the, um, uh, the marker data was extremely difficult. Uh, now that, term, of course, does something, does say something about the, um, uh, 
about my age, I guess. <laughs> I've had my license 50 years. Um, but it's something as you get older, you know, the eyesight's not as good. And trying to read these things gets increasingly difficult. I was pleased to find when I bought the 4.3 inch version that at least I could read the screen. And it's uh, actually um, was quite a pleasant surprise. So it's quite a much more useful package. And um, as a result, although at the moment I still have the 2.8 inch unit, I intend to uh, move that on and I'm sure some deserving case will take it off me for a small price. <laughs> so there we go. Okay, so what else I've said, it's a handheld standalone two port VNA. Frequency range is usually listed as 50 kilohertz to 600 megahertz at full specification. And, and we'll be looking into that when we look at the architecture. And uh, you'll also see 900 megs listed uh, more recently, 1.5 gigahertz, 1500 megahertz. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> we'll be going into that, as you will see. It is not just an antenna analyzer. It is a proper two-port BNA in the way that it attempts to operate even though there are a few flaws in the way that it does it. It will measure gain and loss. Uh, so you can measure amplifiers with some limitations uh, and insertion loss, so attenuators, that sort of thing. You also measure BSWR return loss. Um, so you can use it as a single port um, device to measure antennas because it's low cost, of course, that's an attraction. Um, but it's much more than that. The displays you can set to be either linear or polar displays and grouped in polar displays I always put the Smith chart in there and, um, uh, and you can get those on the screen. One of my pet hates um, that appear all too numerously on eBay by most of the sellers is they had this nasty habit of superimposing a, a Smith chart over a rectangular or linear display. And in real use, professionally, nobody ever does that. <laughs> it's just incredible to me that you would want to. But uh, there you go. <coughs> that's just my professional background coming out, I'm afraid. One thing that's true with all VNOs is they must, no option, must be calibrated with a calibration kit and hence why you get one with it. Okay, um, measurement points, on-screen measurement points. Now this is measurement points, that's nothing to do with the screen resolution in pixels. There's more than, there is a more than adequate number of pixels in the screen display, but the number of measurement points is fixed on these things at 101 points. And there's nothing you can do about that. It's, it's fixed. Um, we'll discuss that in the architecture a little bit later and surmise why that might, might be. That I haven't seen it written on the websites anywhere with the manufacturers, but um, I, I suspect it's a memory problem. The other thing they all have is some sort of internal rechargeable lithium battery. So um, that's quite useful when you take it outside. And it seems to be quite long lasting, which is, um, is, is quite nice. Um, so uh, we'll have a look at that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so let's, um, let's move on. So here is the package that I got with the 4.3 inch screen, called Nano VNA F. There are fewer manufacturers of this unit, which is a good thing, um, and fewer resellers. And um, the people that make this one seem to be quite good. You'll see there is an amateur call sign associated with this when we look at the architecture. So um, that's quite interesting. And um, what you get in the package, well, the package consists of, it comes in a cardboard box, but inside you'll find this plastic box, which is quite nice for carrying all the bits around with a snap-down lid. 
So that's quite useful. Um, <clears throat> so nano VNA. Um, here are the three calibration parts: the open and short, and the load. Um, just here, uh, you can see one of the two RG179 SMA to SMA male cables, and then a few more bits. Um, another one of these rather low quality um, female to female SMA adapters. Uh, a, a rather better male to male SMA, and for some reason, a, a right angle uh, um, male to female SMA. I haven't worked out with that one score, um, but I won't be using it. <laughs> um, so, um, that's that's what you get you, you get quite a lot of information with this this thing um with the 2.8 inch package as i say if you're lucky you get a menu map and that's about all you get there's no other instructions with the um uh, with this particular package you won't be able to see this probably on the screen very well but you actually get a manual um such as it is um it's in two languages chinese which i don't tend to understand, although I'm familiar with looking at it from my many trips to Shanghai, um, and, um, and in English, so you get that. It does actually give some basic operation and driving instructions, which is quite good, how to do calibration and all the rest of it. And I always, one thing I really like with this, it just amuses me, is the list of parts, where it tells you what's in the package, and it lists the manual, but there's a, a slight Chinese translation that comes across here, which is they describe the manual instead of a, a, an abridged manual or a short form manual, they describe it as an incomplete manual. And so you draw, draw your own conclusions from that. <laughs> and so um, there we go. The other thing this has is quite a large, uh, quite a bit larger because the package is bigger, um, internal lithium battery. In fact, they even provide a, a, an extra USB connector so you can use it to back up your mobile phone. There's an added bonus. Okay, so other nano VNAs. Now, some of you may well have this one. I think Neil told me he did. This is the nano VNA V2, and there are a number of, a couple of different part numbers for them. This one is the 2.8 inch display. And this has this rather, what I describe as open frame construction um, that you can see, because you can see the circuit board under here. So it's open looking into the sides. But it is a small display, and as I say, this nasty habit they have of putting um, the Smith chart over the uh, rectangular display. Uh, this is a phase display, by the way, this one. That's the Smith chart. And, uh, there's a blue one down here and the yellow one. Uh, so there we go. I love turning on all four displays just to show they can. I think you'll see this is 2.8 inch because you can judge against the size of the SMA connectors. And one thing that's different with this unit is that the it has again a fixed number of display points, but there are 201 points now, so we've got a bit more resolution. We'll probably see some of that a bit later. The other unit that um, I managed to find is this one that says it has a four inch display. Uh, so again, it's the V2. Uh, yeah, again, you can probably figure it out because these connectors look much smaller against the, uh, the display. Um, the housing it's in looks a bit strange. I haven't worked out what this bit is over here. It looks like somebody's taking a metal nibbler to the aluminium case. Um, but you can see that um, they're displaying a number of parts with it two cables a usb lead a little bag with some uh, calibration parts i've no idea what else you get with these things uh, because i do not have one of these um <clears throat> and one of the features of this um this unit is the um oops, let's go back is is the um uh it, supposedly works up to uh, three gigahertz and again we'll look at that when we see the architecture and uh, see that uh, it's possible for it to do that uh, right so okay so one of the things i said earlier i'm going to 
compare some things against, and you'll see some plots from this, is the DG8 SAQ, because it has a very similar frequency range, in fact, listed on the front here, 1 kilohertz to 1.3 gigahertz. We'll see how it does that. Let's move on. Um, and one of the things, again, I said we must do with these things is um, most of the units will require a PC to display uh, data uh, because all VNAs and all VNAs require a calibration kit. And we know the nano VNAs don't require the PC, but later I'll show you what you can do if you, if you have some software running. Um, so they all need calibration kits. Now, this bit may not be something you're familiar with, but um, in order to make use of the calibration kit, bear in mind there are three parts, an open, a short, open circuit, a short circuit, and a, and a load, a 50 ohm load. And they all need within them some the error maths for complex impedance calculation um, and, phase, and generating phase. In order to do that, they use something called a six-term error correction. More sophisticated VNAs use 12-term error correction. But six-term, where does that come from? Well, you've got three calibration parts, and you've got two sets of information coming out of them. You've got amplitude and phase or complex impedance, which gives you both. So two times three is six. That's all that means. But it has to have that error correction maths or it doesn't work. Um, Rory said the displays can be set to rectangular or polar uh, Smith format displays, and you can display the data in many formats, um, including scattering parameters or better known as S parameters, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, just to bring you up to speed, S parameter notation. The simple diagram at the top is what the nano VNAs use. The bottom is the more sophisticated one for two port <coughs> uh, VNAs. Uh, but basically, apologies for my scan didn't work right you now. That should say S11, which is the correct way to say it. It isn't S11 or S21, it's S21. And the key bit is that the S convention is the first number is the number where the energy comes out, that's port two. And the second number is the port where the energy goes in. So in insertion loss and gain measurements are S21, because the signal is um, coming out of here and going in here. And a reflection measurement is S11, because the the signal is both going in and coming out of the same port, of course, that's the reflection. The more sophisticated uh, thing adds the other two uh, to give you S12 and S22. Although that's oversimplistic because three port devices, you get S33 and uh, a whole another sequence of numbers, but I'm not going to go into that here. But that's just to bring you up to speed. On the back or the bottom, sorry, of the um, uh, of the um, nano VNA F, they actually put an S parameter diagram for you that shows um, S11, uh, S21, um, S22, and S12. Although it can't actually do those two directly, if you want to get them, you actually have to switch the device around manually by reconnecting it. Again, a more sophisticated VNA uh, will do that um, for you. So <clears throat> let's get to the important bit in VNA architecture, what's inside the box. And um, there's quite a nice diagram uh, uh, for the nano VNA F, um, which says it's by BH5HNU, who's obviously a Chinese amateur. Um, and that's quite a nice diagram. What I want to focus on is if we could just ignore this lump down the bottom here to start with and just really look at what's going on up here. Uh, I'm going to start down here 
we've got a, a synthesizer they all have some sort of built-in uh, synthesizer chip in this case it's the uh, SI uh, Silicon Labs SI 5351A um, and labeled on the diagram it says 50 kilohertz to 300 megahertz mm, okay <laughs> Not quite what I read in the data sheet, but I see where they're coming from. And that's feeding a signal into this thing, which is labeled bridge. This is an RF weak stone bridge, and it's made up fundamentally of four resistors, um, surface mount resistors. So it had quite a good frequency response. And that's labeled as port one. And so a signal is fed in here, it comes across the bridge and is fed out of this port hits the device under test and for the purposes of making a reflective measurement it comes back in goes around the bridge and it goes into this receiver and you'll see there's three identical ones these are made up with the SA612 AD device and you're probably familiar with that and if you're not you may well be familiar with the oldest version of it which um, a lot of us, uh, certainly in my age, came across, came across uh, many years ago, labelled NE602. It's a thing called a Gilbert cell mixer, um, designed for use in receivers, and many amateur projects have used them. The SA612AD is, all that that is, is this modern surface mount version of it. It's in a much smaller package. The old NE602 was in an 8-pin dual in-line package. And the uh, bond wires probably limited its frequency range to 200 megahertz. It would squeak up to 300 if you were lucky. and starts to drop off fairly violently after that. The 612AD, according to its data sheet, works up to 500 megahertz which is interesting in terms of uh, claims of 900 meg and 1500 meg operation. So uh, prepare to be uh, a little bit uh, 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 sceptical about that. Uh, <coughs> so that's where the reflected signal goes. Uh, to do that, we need a reference signal and that's supplied to all, there are three of these, um, so acting as a local oscillator is the secondary signal out of the SI5351A. And the sort of IF signal, which is what's coming out of here, is roughly at about uh, in the low kilohertz region, somewhere between 1 and 15 kilohertz. I think they say 12 kilohertz for most operation. So it's quite a low frequency. So this is the reference signal. So it's got a reference and a reflection, and it's taking the ratio of those two to generate the uh, <coughs> um, reflected um, data. If we want to use port 2, we've got a separate input here, using a, a third uh, 612, of course. And, and that's for the through path. And that's also fed in here, some sort of frequency range. And this thing is, a, uh, I guess, a some sort of three-way audio codec. Now, I don't know if they do that with a single codec, which is basically an A to D, um, or whether they've actually got three in there. I've no idea. I don't know this part. I didn't bother to look it up, to be quite honest. But um, same principle, whichever way you do it. And uh, you could use three individual parts in there uh, and just uh, uh, and switch the output, digital output. So... Um, so that basically is how it works. Um, you'll see this um, synthesizer down here is clocked with some sort of uh, 26 meg um, TCXO, which gives you good stability. And then um, in order to uh, display all the measurements, you've got a microprocessor, which is what this thing uh, is doing. So it's reasonably powerful. It's not the most powerful, obviously, but pretty good and that's driving the uh, dot matrix display which is 480 by 100 uh, pixels so uh, sorry 480 by 800 pixels so you know quite a quite a reasonable as I said the display is uh, pretty good and uh, all the other stuff that goes with that we'll dwell on that so 
that's the nano DNA, and that's the same architecture for both the H and F versions. There's no real difference other than they may be using some different sort of stuff. But this this fundamental RF bit down to the to the low frequency IF and the synthesizer, that's all the same, even if they use some slightly different processing. It's doing all the same things. As I say, I suspect that there's some memory limitation in here which is pre preventing uh, them from using more than 101 display um, uh, and data points for the measurements. Because the problem with that is that you need not only 101 data points for the measurement, you've got to store another 101 points for the calibration. You've got to bear that in mind with these things that whatever you've got in data points, you also need in calibration points. Now let's have a look at the V2 version, the uh, supposed 3 gig version. Not quite such a nice diagram that I had to uh, um, <coughs> borrow. <laughs> I don't feel bad about it. Uh, Chinese don't care about copyright. <laughs> or repent, I mean borrow anything. Um, so uh, this is a VLA2 architecture. Up here they call it a coupler. Again, it's an RF um, Wheatstone bridge, no difference there. Um, over here, you'll see we've got more than one synthesizer. I think, well, no, I think, I'm sure, this is the same ADF4350 uh, synthesizer, just that the ADF4350 has two outputs, and I think that's what that's really meaning, for using an output um, from each half. And the SI... Uh, 5351 also has two outputs and they're making use of that here and then you'll see there's an awful lot of switches these are solid state switches that are going on and down here there is a single mixer which is not not an AD612 it's a uh, totally different device an AD8342 I'll tell you about that in a minute going into a what we call a baseband amplifier and then into their processing system so there's only one receiver in this, and hence why there's loads of switches. We're having to switch everything. This is our uh, through port. So what they're having to do here is at each data point, they're having to stop, uh, get, settle the synthesizer. Um, and, and yeah, what I should say is that this is, they only use the SI5351 synthesizer up to 140 megahertz that's what they will tell that's what it says above 140 megahertz they switch over to the 4350 which will work up to three gigahertz so there's a bit of a clue there about how it's working much higher frequency uh, device and the mixer is 8342 um, uh, according to its data sheet um, operates up to um 2.7 gigahertz uh sorry up to three three gigahertz it will work to 3.8 i think yeah rated to 3.8 gigahertz so quite a high frequency mixer in comparison with the with the other uh, vnas and uh, these switches are rated up to 2.7 gigahertz in fact the type number on them is MXD8641, and the, the, the data sheet says 100 megahertz to 2.7 gigahertz. So, um, so what we've got uh, is this: uh, the, everything is switched by these switches. So it has to stop on a data point, set, having set a frequency, switch the switches one way, send the signal out get the reflector back, set the switches the other way. If you're doing insertion loss as well, set another set of switches. I guess setting the synthesizer switches is a wee bit easier, of course. So there's sort of three operations going every time that um, it takes data. That's a different way of doing it. Uh, I guess it works perfectly well. We can see it's a bit, um, a bit tedious and long-winded, and um, I'm sure there's some latency involved in there, but... Um, uh, uh, the benefit, I guess, is, or I'm pretty sure, is that you're going to get three gig operation, which uh, 
those of us interested in microwaves is clearly going to uh, be of some sort of benefit. I don't think I'm intending to buy one of these. I've got a 6 gig DNA, so I'm perfectly happy. Moving on, calibration. And again, apologies for the uh, break in transmission. Um, <clears throat> a standard VNA calibration kit, uh, this is for any VNA, should consist of an offset, sh a short, which is often an offset short. In fact, if it's type N, it will be an offset short. I'll explain what that's about. Um, an SMA short might be offset or flush. Again, uh, I'll talk about that uh, later. An open circuit um, that has its own problems called fringe capacitance. We'll cover that. Um, uh, a 50 ohm load, which are called 50 ohm ish, <laughs> because when there's a 50 ohm, it's not 50 ohms. It's a bit like that. The parts in the calibration kit are usually provided with data to be entered into the VNA. They are in most VNAs, but not in the nano VNAs, we should see. Um, and male and female kits in different connectors types are usually available. Again, not in the nano VNA. They only provide the male kit. Um, and as we'll see, there's no option, no opportunity or option to have a female kit that you can enter at least not in the standalone version. Um, the offset lengths, when we're looking at offsets, can be entered in millimetres, which you can, in a type N, you can certainly measure directly, or can be in picoseconds. Um, if you measure in picoseconds, you have to multiply by two because the signal is going into the back short and coming back out. That's what the Americans call a round trip. So, um, that can be um, a problem to uh, to deal with. Um, this is a sample of a uh, professional Rosenberger calibration kit for a 3.5 millimeter connector, which is like an SMA but works at a higher frequency and doesn't have the um, the uh, big PTFE beads in it. It's much more um, uh, large, um, largely air with a small uh, thin bead supporting the uh, center pins um, and you'll see this this um, uh, this is a card you get with the kit that shows the uh, this is the female kit as it says we've got an open circuit and a short circuit short circuits easy to quantify they just tell you the offset length which is five millimeters and the uh, the female also offset length of five millimeters that means from something called the reference plane and we'll look at that back to the back short is five millimeters and then these things which are the um, fringe capacitance um, you can see they're quite small numbers in fact this one's in uh, femtofarads um, almost 10 to the minus 15 it would be so um, 59 femtofarads so it's a pretty small capacitance and uh, uh, professional VNAs would make use of that to um, make corrections for the uh, open circuit device uh, and a bit more simple on the uh, on the short. The nano VNA calibration kits consist of um, SMA uh, kits, um, SOL kit is what it's called, short open load kit. Um, you get a male SMA with a pin protruding from a flat four millimeter diameter disc. It has no PTFE insulator on. It's almost what we would call a flush short. Um, when I looked at it on a Smith shaft, it's not quite, I can see a little bit of offset length, but it's quite small. Uh, the open circuit is a male SMA with an outer ring, but no inner pin. It's all been ground away inside, so it looks like a hollow tube with a back short in it. There's no PTFE in PTFE insulator, so the ring is what is normally holding the PTFE insulator, but there's nothing inside this, uh, the open. Um, and they don't give us any data for the fringe capacitance, so we have no idea what's going on there. And the load is a male SMA 50 ohm load in a pretty conventional package. Um, so um, that's uh, pretty fine. Again, they don't tell us anything about that load. But we can do some measurements on it as you'll see. 
And there are two lengths of coax provided for the through cal when an SOLT, short open load through calibration, is required. There is no data for these parts not provided in the package and it's not provided online as far as I can find anyway. There's a photo of the kit. Apologies, it's really difficult to photo photograph these things. My um, macro zoom on the uh, digital camera is struggling to get down to these sort of sizes. Um, in SMA, it's a lot easier when you're photographing type N. But basically, you've got um, uh, short, open load is uh, how that works. That's, I think, from the VNA H kit. Um, in contrast, um, if you buy a more expensive kit for something like the DG8 SAQ, um, these are Rosenberger kits, and you can see they consist of, uh, this is the male kit, so um, we've got a short, an open, and a load, and a male-to-male -male for um, some other purpose, and the female kit, so we've got a load, a short, and this thing is used as an open, it's really just a female back-to-back. -back. But uh, the characteristics of these four parts are provided on sheets with the kits, so you've got some data to enter. And the DG8 SAQ allows you to do that. There is also a DC value for the 50 ohm resistors, which is marked with the kit uniquely. Um, as it says on the male kit, 49.41 ohms and 49.16 for the uh, female. And that data has been measured by, um, uh, I think it's a Danish amateur, if I remember correctly, and OZ, I can't remember his call, um, but um, Kurt Paulson, I think, I've got that correct. Probably haven't pronounced it correctly. Um, so, um, uh, so that's quite good. And the uh, resistances have been measured with a four terminal Kelvin uh, measurement, so they're probably fairly accurate. Uh, I did some analysis. I've got a, um, a peak uh, Atlas 45 component anal analyzer that does uh, resistance, capacitance, inductance. So I've, uh, I've done some measurements with that and um, had a look at the, uh, the CalKit 50 ohm loads. Um, what we can see is uh, run one didn't seem to be quite as good, but um, I did three runs and took the average. And I, here's the H kit, um, here's the VNA F kit. These are the this is the male Rosenberg because these are all SMA male because that's all you get with these two. And I had a Weinstein load and a Nada load, so you can see I've got values, uh, and they average out. They're all around 50 ohms but don't expect them to be exact. And remember, this is DC, so um, it's not quite, definitely not the same as when you uh, model one of these things at um, RF and up. If you've got an N-type uh, system, uh, it's much easier to measure because it's a much bigger part. As you can see, here's the pin, the back short's down there, not this bit this side. That's the reference plane where that ring is, which is nice and easy to see. That's where you measure from. And how do you measure it? If you've got a vernier caliper, vernier gauge, you use this end of it, get this bit to stick out, and then stick it down that gap because it's big enough to do that. And you can measure the offset length, which is the distance between there and the back short. And I measured it as 5.3 millimeters. And you can make use of that and convert it to picoseconds and so on. Um, so there we go. Um, the Rosenberger kits, which were listed as five millimetres, that comes out as, um, I did calculate it out actually, it's uh, 16.7 picoseconds or 33.4 for what we call the round trip. So VNA, uh, nano VNA calibration, um, a single port calibration suitable for one port, devices like antennas or dummy loads, you only need a open, short and load. You can calibrate directly at the test port, which is labelled test port 1 on the PNAF. Uh, unfortunately, in the H version, it's labelled CH channel 0, CH0. Uh, 
or you can measure at the end of a cable which you would uh, connect to port to port two. Um, well, I wrote one in there, but uh, there we go. Um, and they call it port one on the on the H version. That's where the confusion is coming. Um, if you're measuring two port devices, which I'm going to show you in a moment, uh, at the end of a single cable um, is all you can really do, even when you've got two cables, because no correction is made on the uh, on port two, despite what you might think. Um, Port 2 for the through measurement only compensates for the source match. It takes out the cable ripple of the cable connected to port 1. Um, a more sophisticated version which you get on, you can get on the DGH SAQ is something called a uh, through match. And that gives you a, a, a correction to the, um, uh, to the uh, receiver port. So what do we mean by calibration at the end of a cable? I think it's pretty obvious. We connect one of the cables to port one here. And then I've got, I've just shown it with a load connected here for a, um, a female to female back to back uh, connector. Uh, not the one in the kit. I've got a slightly better one that's easier to grip. Um, make the measurement at the end of the cable. And you can see the return loss is so I tend to display in rather than VSWR, it's more reliable. Um, and when we do the through, obviously that connector is connected there. So that's calibration at the end of a cable. And it's very good because it takes out the, the ripple from this cable. We'll see some of that in just a moment. And it really is one of the important aspects that you get with a VNA, this ability to calibrate at the end of a coax cable. And the cable could also be connector adapters. And these are quite useful because when you've only got SMA connectors on the device, they're not very robust, unfortunately. And uh, they are, you know, they can be easily damaged. You'll find no professional VNAs ever use SMAs for exactly that reason, because you're making a lot of calibrations. And the calibration pieces from the calpit kit are applied to either the end of the, to the end of the cable attached to port one and it reduces cable ripple. Um, if you use two cables port two is it's nearly impossible to reduce the cable ripple unless you've got a calibration that actually does three more parts on the other port which um, isn't available in the uh, in the calibration uh, menu. Okay. Um, so here's an example of a connector adapters. I did actually use my DG8 SAQ with these on for quite some years because I was aware of this problem with the SMAs and uh, it's helped quite a lot. But as I've recently upgraded it, I've now got N types on mine anyway. If I want SMA, I use adapters down to SMA. So you're going to take out any of these parts or this one in particular. Okay, so let's look at some measurements. Um, don't worry about what this thing is. It's, it's actually a, a filter I designed for 23SEM. It's a low-pass filter. Um, and it's actually got a cutoff frequency of 1500 megahertz. And the nano V and I can't measure it. So I haven't really tried, but it was quite small. And therefore easy to get in shot in the camera. And make some measurements with. And... Um, You'll see I've connected two cables. I calibrated at the end of this cable, connected it to the input, and then put a cable on the output. And what you can see here is the insertion loss at the top, return loss in dB at the bottom, which is equivalent to VSWR, but it gives you logarithmic compression. It means we can get it all on the screen easily. It's really impossible to do if you use VSWR. And what you can see is this very sort of ripply, bumpy response is entirely due to this cable. There's, not, there's almost no way of taking it out. And I'll show you one way I did take it out, but you'll see it's a bit of a cheat. Um, here's the proper way to do it. This is my opinion. Um, it always works for me. <laughs> and because I've got a small filter, the short cables provided with this thing um, allow me to measure this uh, this filter 
uh, and you'll see that uh, the only difference is we've added in here, or I've added in a male to male um, SMA. So I'm actually measuring that plus the filter. As it's quite short, it really doesn't impinge on the measurement. Um, so that's how that works. I'm just going to go back a slide. One of the things you might notice if you can see on your screens around here, you'll see this rather ugly bump or not sure whatever you want to call it in the insertion loss response um, that occurs at exactly 900 megahertz so please bear that number in mind because when i first saw it i thought on earth sat doing there but as um, as i made some more measurements it became obvious what it what it you know, why it's occurred so that's exactly at 900 megahertz when I went to the single cable, you'll see it's actually disappeared. And what I've got is a much nicer curve, and I happen to know that's what the um, uh, the match on the input of this filter in the pass band, because you can see it's only just rolling off at the top end um, in the uh, in the top of the pass band. That's the blue trace here. The yellow trace is the uh, return loss and you can see this nice shape and that is what it should look like so it's giving a reasonable representation using a calibration here but not putting a cable here and what i then did was to take my second cable put it back to back between them and then calibrate on a, a double length cable and then connect it up and uh, I'm getting quite a reasonable representation for the return loss, but I've noticed that my 900 megahertz thing has reappeared. And so I began to suspect it's due to cable length that was causing this problem. But I don't think that's the only reason. There's something else going on that also become clear, and some of you may have figured it out already. So I tried another cable. I've got a quite a good quality gore cable this is an armored cable um, in SMA to SMA and it's a bit longer and of course I can measure bigger devices with it um, I left that in there and again I got a reasonable response um, when I did that there was still a bit of hint of this 900 meg thing going on so I decided at this point to swap filters and put on my um, uh, almost my standard filter. I designed this quite a few years ago. It's a, a uh, 170 megahertz low pass filter. Um, designed and built that one. It's, it's it's a high power filter for a high power valve amplifier when I originally built it. Uh, our contest group had um, uh, built a uh, high power valve amplifier but I noticed it didn't have any output filter on it. So I, uh, I, I sat down and designed this one. It will handle a kilowatt. Um, uh, but it's an end type, so I've had to use some adapters. But I calibrated on the end of the cable, this gore cable, and I'm getting quite a good um, response in the stop band. Here's our return loss, and that's very good, that looks fine. And the, the pass band response, and then down into the stop band, looks fine until we get down here. Now, remember, I've changed frequency, and in the middle of the screen again. I'm getting this weird response and um, this response is at 300 megahertz and at this point the penny dropped as to what, what was causing it but it's all to do with I think the harmonic uh, situation within the uh, the oscillator and these things SSI 5351 which um, above 200 megahertz is working with harmonics so I'm pretty sure that what's going on is that we're seeing a second harmonic at 300 megs, which is causing this problem, and a sixth harmonic at 900 megs. And I'm pretty sure that's what's doing it, aided and abetting a bit by cable lengths, I suspect. Um, but that point there should be tacked onto there and disappearing into the uh, into the bottom, of course. So um, beware of things like that. I guess the 3 gig version shouldn't have that, but I'll leave those that have got them to check. And here's a screen grab, and we're going to see a bit more of this in a moment. Um, uh, this uh, comes from a, a software, PC software package I'm going to show you in a second or two. Um, 
by a nano VNA saver software. That's an actual screen grab directly from the screen of the nano, nano VNAF um, of the 170 meg filter. You can see a bit more graphically what's going on. You can see the marker here I've set exactly 300 megs where that's occurring. So um, that's quite good. And you can see the calibration. Um, it's, it's, it's taken all the parts I've, uh, uh, and I've made the cal, stored it in uh, cal store zero. It has five stores labeled 0 to 4. Um, and you can see we can put mar a marker on the screen and we can get um, uh, details about that. So uh, it's gone down 26 dB to there, but the, re the real number, as you can see, is uh, more like 30 33. Uh, so uh, that's obviously giving us a false impression at 300 megs. Bear in mind the second harmonic is going to be around here somewhere. Or the two meter signal. Um, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll do a cross check with the DG8SAQ with its end type connectors. And you'll see I've had to use a, a male end to end barrel here. Um, and um, same filter same frequency range exactly so you know try to use everything the same to do the comparison and i'm going to show you what the software does there's two p three pieces of software i'm going to look at and we're nearly at the end of the presentation um and in fact the manual like nano bnaf manual actually um refers to two of these that's the first two something called nano vna exe and this one, Nano VNA Saber. Uh, I guess this guy's Scandinavian, but I don't know any more details. And then there's a modified version I came across on their uh, on their website, which uh, is called Nano VNA Sharp, um, but it's really just a modified version of this one. And these 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 two are fairly simple programs. They're just capture and display programs. Um, they can run calibration routines and save and load files in touchstone format. I don't know if you've come across touchstone format, but it was invented many years ago by a company called ESOF in the USA uh, in 1984. And uh, although it's long since defunct, the format of the files, as their text files, is still used by VNAs today, and it's very useful because you can save and load files in that format um, to and from VNAs. It's extremely useful, and in fact, I've been using it um, with these uh, with these two programs. The Nano VNA Saver is a much larger program. These are about 175 k bytes. This thing's about 75 megabytes, so it's quite a bit bigger, but it has a lot more features including quite a useful one you can chain sweeps to gain more than 101 display points in the program uh, but you can only do it while you're running the program it won't, you can't take it offline um, and, and it basically uh, takes chunks of 101 points even somebody's done one with a thousand and ten points which is ten it does ten individual 101 point sweeps which means that it uh, probably takes 10 seconds to capture the data. So here's the first of them. It's called Nano VNA XE version 1.03. I've looked at the 170 meg low pass filter. Um, and um, here's the display that you've already seen on the screen. On the left side is all the um, data setup. Um, so you've got a COM port to connect to your Nano VNA. Um, you've got to find that, which you can do by refreshing and, and then bring down a drop down list from your PC. Find the right one and then tell it to connect and it'll connect to the Nano VNA. You can then, if you wish to, you can it'll either capture the current settings for frequency of the nano VNA, or you can set your own up and it will send them back into the VNA and uh, and reset. In this case, I've just I've just captured the settings, and then if you're connected, which I'm not in this case, you'll see this get data box will, be, will look like that in blue. Um, when you click on it, it will then take a sweep, a single sweep across the screen. You can make it do 
continuous sweeping by ticking in this box labeled auto refresh. Um, each sweep is uh, 1200 milliseconds or 1.2 seconds. And here's this rather useful fe feature where you can um, save files in touchstone format. Um, the formats are S1P, that's just a single port view, so a single port um, would just take one set of data which consists of frequency, real and, real and imaginary parts, or S2P, which takes real and imaginary parts of both the reflected signal and the transmission signal. So you get five sets of data in that case. Or you can load them back in, which is easy to do. And I, I've done that in um, one of the other slides just coming up. Down the bottom, you can save instrument state and recall it. Um, which is quite useful. Um, response, really, all you can do with that is calibrate. It'll just take you through the calibration routine, which is probably easier than tapping on the 2.8 inch screen, I might add. <laughs> um, and it does that fairly well. Um, in this particular program, you'll see there's a, a box labeled language with Chinese characters. It takes you into Chinese characters and um, you have to click on it if you want to get back to English. And the usual things about about and firmware info. The capture screen um, is quite nice because it allows you, allows you to set up the chart format, in this case log mag, that's log magnitude in rectangular scale, S11 and S21, so um, uh, in this case insertion loss and return loss, uh, which you can set to VSWR if you wish. Best of luck. Um, and you can set the top and bottom scales here with these, which again is quite nice. It will auto scale them, but I don't like auto scale, as you will discover. So that's quite nice. You can get a nice sort of set the screen up how you want it. So it's pretty good. Um, so this screen is, is the uh, uh, I've used. The program here, there's a little cursor that's appeared, but don't worry about that. Um, and what I've done is I've, I've saved the uh, file I measured on the DG8 SOQ analyzer, saved the uh, touchstone file as an S2P file, and then I've loaded it back in onto this display. So just de demonstrating rather nicely that this software works with these uh, touchstone files, which is quite useful. And you can move this cursor along and it will display the data for you at the cursor. And again, you can scale it on the screen, so quite, um, quite useful. Uh, you can see that in this case, the DG8 SAQ didn't register anything nasty at 300 megs. And I, and I already knew that, of course. And here's the other one, VNA Sharp. And the main difference you'll see is here where you've got the sub um, uh, graphical ticks everywhere. Same sort of trace, slightly different scale. Most of this is the same. Um, the only difference really in this screen is that they take, the guy that's done this has taken out the uh, Chinese language version. So you don't ac accidentally click it and get it in Chinese and you have to remember which box to click to uh, get it back into English. So, um, so that's quite useful. Um, <clears throat> so, quite nice. so these two capture programs, quite, quite nice, they're otherwise pretty much identical. But they do the job and they don't take up too much space. And now we come to VNA Saver, which is a much bigger program lot more complicated, loads of stuff on markers going on here and display data in uh, all sorts of formats uh, where it's showing phase and uh, gain, really imaginary parts, L and C and all, all that. You know, so it's a lot of data that's able to take, hence the size of it. Um, sweep settings. It's got one particular feature, this chaining feature. Up here, if you can see where it says segments, two, which is what I've set this to, it's two segments means I'm taking two 101 point sweeps. So I've got 202 points instead of 101. 
which is a little bit nicer in the display, points are closer together. I noticed on 101 with a big screen, it's, it does look a bit, um, a bit peculiar, because of course it draws straight lines between the individual points. And if you've only got 101 points over, um, we've been looking at 800 meg and 400 meg sweeps, you, um, you, you've got, well, eight megs between each point, or four megs even up to 400 megs. Um, so sweep settings, getting sweeps, you can have still um, continuous sweeps if you want to. And um, one of the things that I found maddening about this program is there didn't seem to be any way of setting the top and bottom of the screen or scaling it. And I couldn't find anywhere. And I thought down here is where it's a display set up. Oh, that must be it. Uh, no, it's just more marker stuff. So <laughs> it frustrating. I found this one rather frustrating. And um, I'm not particularly a fan, but obviously it is uh, advertised. I understand that the, the, the uh, software writer is doing some more work on it. So maybe there's hope for the future. Um, but to be complete, I uh, felt I should show it. And then another screen, I clicked on a, a screen at the bottom labeled calibration. And when you do that, you've got your calibration menu coming up here with all the things you want to do. And on the right hand side, this um, piece of software allows you to put in data about the short, putting in small inductances for the short, or fringe capacitance for the opens, and resistance for the load. Uh, and you can put in an offset delay for the through measurement. So all those things are possible. And that's quite nice. That is a nice feature if you've got the data to do it with. You certainly haven't got it for the nano VNA parts. But again, you can only use it while you're connected, uh, while the nano VNA is connected to the PC and running the software. It's not transportable, so uh, that's the only problem. And, you know, people have said, well, you can do all this with this software. Well, yes, you can. But my answer to that is that one of the really nice things about the, uh, these nano VNAs, now uh, we're coming to the end, is um, obviously very low price. That's probably obvious. The LCD display, the rechargeable battery, that's a, a fairly key, key feature because it's a standalone VNA with no PC. Previously, I want to measure antennas outside, for example, I have to take my laptop out there with the DG8SOQ. You can do it directly with these things without needing to. So why do I want to take the PC out to, to run the software? And it can provide more information than most antenna analyzers because, of course, it is a true vector. On the downside, <coughs> You've got a very small 2.8 inch display on the uh, BNAH. I found it too small and fiddly, but there's no doubt that the 4 inch, 4.3 uh, inch display is definitely uh, make it a lot easier. The fixed display of 101 display and calibration points is a little bit of a, uh, you know, that's a definitely uh, something that would be nice, but as I say, I think it might be. Uh, uh, memory limited on the processor. Um, there's no data for the short open load calibration pieces and we don't even know if any data is being applied and I must admit I suspect not. I think they're being treated as something that's sometimes referred to as ideal standards. What does that mean? It means it's a perfect short circuit, zero ohm short circuit, a perfect open infinite and a perfect 50 ohm, 50 point naught 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 ohms um, and it's obviously and there are obviously none of those things but that's what they're using so standalone it can only use the sma supplied kit so you can't use any other sex of kit or any other type of kit there's no three match calibration the three match calibration is, only, is not available for port two you can only calibrate at the end of a single cable doesn't apply anything other than it improves the source match that's the match of the port which is the end of the cable 
being set into the um, into the device. And incidentally, this this slide that I show you that is the match looking into the receiver port. So it's a little bit better than 20 dB return loss, or if it's 22 dB, it's 1.2 to 1 VSWR. Um, and the use of harmonics for a local oscillator above 200 megs is going to affect, well, definitely affects dynamic range, and they tell you that it drops off very markedly, which is why I think 1500 megs, quite honestly, is a no no. And, and these nasty glitches at uh, harmonics of the LO, it's uh, not very pleasant to look at. And the software, well, these two are really the same with only minor modification. And um, and so on. The import of the touchstone files is nice, and uh, this one needs a bit more work. So, uh, but chaining the sweep to sweeps is obviously useful. Well, that's it, go, uh, folks. Sorry, that's uh, took a bit longer than I expected. I'm sorry about the glitch um, with uh, having to uh, reset the thing. That was a bit of a nuisance. Um, I just couldn't get the back key to work, having uh, somehow destroyed it. So, uh, back to you, um, Neil, and I'm going to stop my screen sharing. Okay. Um, I mean, we're still seeing you, Brian. Can you mute your... Um... <laughs> right, okay. Um... Okay, I'm not sure. Yeah, oh, there I am. Yeah, okay. I'm just looking on the uh, the stream of what's coming through. Um, yeah, okay, Brian, thank you very much uh, for uh, a really comprehensive um, uh, talk and uh, uh, a lot of data there and a lot of things uh, uh, to uh, consider. Um, if you've got any questions, can you please uh, ask them through the uh, chat uh, box on the uh, uh, the um, uh, BAT st uh, streamer, and uh, we'll try and um, pick up uh, the uh, the questions. Uh, uh, John, I don't know if you're there. Are you were going to um, look after the, uh, the the questions? Um, perhaps you can uh, just confirm whether you are or not. Uh, yes, I can read them out and uh, pass them on. Yeah, because the laptop that I've um, got the uh, streamer on is uh, the other side of the uh, shack here. Um, I hope everybody had a, a good um, copy uh, of the video and uh, audio. I, I noticed on um, there was some a little bit of chat about people not uh, getting um, uh, it uh, all the time, but I was watching both the um, the downlink on the on the Zoom and the downlink on the the BATC streamer as uh, as well as up, uploading um, my stream. Uh, on Zoom to the streamer as well, um, and uh, it was perfect the, the whole time. So um, uh, I hope most people um, uh, managed to uh, to watch about uh, a break. So um, I mean, I've got I've just got one quick question for you, Brian. Um, not knowing anything really about uh, VNAs, but uh, I do have the, uh, uh, the the first version of the VA uh, 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 Nano VA uh, VNA. Um, What's the maximum cable length that uh, you can use uh, between uh, the uh, the uh, BNA and the device under test? Um, well, it's a reasonable question. Uh, the answer is, in some ways, is almost any length. But obviously, <laughs> you can't get silly about it. It's more to do with loss. If you have a cable that's got a, a you know, a big loss per metre, what you've effectively done is you've uh, reduced the dynamic range of the system by doing so. So if you've only got a cable that's 1 dB of loss, then that's not too uh, too bad. If you've got something that's got 30 dB of loss, then obviously that's a big um, a big chunk of, um, of dynamic range to lose. Um, but I've done that with 5 and 10 metre cables measuring antennas and you can calibrate at the end of the cable. There is a little problem with doing it to do with phase stability, so you must move it all around too much, but um, uh, I've measured antennas that way with the DG8SAQ, and this will be no different. Um, 
in, in that respect, uh, Neil. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I think it does. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Brian. Um, John, do we have any uh, questions via the streamer? Uh, yes, there's one question from Dave who says, thanks for the chat. Given the issues you raise, are these amateur devices worth having in the shack or can they be misleading? Um, I think the answer to that is <laughs> it's easy to mislead yourself as much as anything. Um, I, I have two other VNAs, one you've seen and one you haven't. I've got, got a six gig one as well. So I often ask myself, why do I need these things? But I've worked in the test and measurement industry, so um, perhaps that's an answer. But um, I think the, uh, the certainly the four inch screen, which is a, a much more readable screen, is well worth it. Um, provided you're not trying to make any, uh, what I'll call really precision measurements, I think the answer in the average amateur shack, they probably are worth it because you can use them for as an antenna analyzer and they're a lot cheaper than some of the um, single port devices around. And, um, and they're also good for measuring uh, filters as I demonstrated with that um, 170 meg filter for two meters. Um, it does that perfectly well, almost perfectly well provided you're capable of realising that that glitch isn't real. That's probably the limitation. Uh, uh, so hopefully that'll answer the question. Okay. Is that uh, is anything else, uh, Brian? Uh, uh, John, sorry. Uh, yes, a question from Robin G4IWS. I have two octave wide 20 dB directional couplers I use uh, with it. What does the nano VNA offer beyond this? Um, what, are, what, are, what is being connected to the two 20 dB couplers? That's the question. What are you, what are you putting in and, and measuring the, the, the coupled arm with? That's, that's the, the key there. I mean, you wouldn't use a directional coupler with uh, a nano VNA or any VNA, you wouldn't need to. What they're normally used with is scalar network analysis, so you'll get phase out of those. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. all the questions that are on there just at the moment. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you, Brian. Okay, thank uh, everyone for um, viewing tonight. I, I think we were up to about 165 at um, uh, the peak, and uh, most people have stayed throughout the duration. So. Uh, um, that was good. So, right. OK, the uh, the next talk um, in the series will be in January, uh, Wednesday, uh, the 13th of January, 2021. And that will be by Bari, G8AGN, who will be talking about the uh, VK uh, one, 122 uh, gigahertz um, uh, uh, equipment and the, uh, the experiments that uh, he's been doing um, uh, with the, uh, the, uh, the VK uh, transverters so uh, I think we look forward to that and hopefully uh, uh, you can all join us again um, uh, uh, in uh, I guess it's uh, for five weeks time I think isn't it so um, um, we look forward to uh, to seeing you there so um, on behalf of the uh, UK microwave group um, I'd like to uh, thank you for uh, viewing and uh, look forward to seeing you next time this is G4LDR